energy problem, we all know that. The way that we extract and produce energy in this country is polluting, and it is very harmful to people in the locations where, for example, coal mining takes place. So if you were to propose to those people, we have a new way, and that way is renewable. It's never ending. It's inexhaustible, and it's clean. There is no emissions, and it's domestic. It can happen here, right in our backyards forever. People would be on board with that. But then you slap a turbine in their view or in their backyard, and all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute, this is not what I had in mind. It's the NIMBY thing. It's not in my backyard. Wind energy has negative externalities, just like any other means of energy production. These externalities have generated significant resistance to wind plant siting in many cases. The environmental justice perspective focuses on the disproportionate burdening of marginalized communities, and we will provide a critical analysis of the environmental, social, and financial costs, benefits, and future potential of wind energy from the environmental justice perspective. We will specifically be focusing on New York State as it has been one of the forerunners of wind energy in the United States. So we're here at the Madison Wind Farm in the heart of central New York and one of the frontiers of wind energy in the United States. The topography of the area is pretty ideal for wind energy. Uh, if you notice the series of the hills and the valleys channel the wind through at pretty high speeds. But if we look out, they stretch as far as the eye can see. It's out that better wind farm. And even further to east is the hard scrabble wind farm in Herkimer County. We will begin our critical analysis with the environmental considerations related to wind energy. Specifically, we will consider emissions, bird population effects, and agricultural impacts of wind power. Well, the biggest benefits of wind energy, of course, is that it makes electricity with zero emissions. So in terms of all the different ways that we make energy, I think wind has the least impacts in terms of the environment. One of the environmental concerns that frequently comes up with wind energy is that it is harmful to bird populations. However, variance in migratory routes due to turbines was insignificant compared to normal yearly route variation, and skyscrapers are a much bigger threat to birds than turbines. Bird conservancy groups like Audubon have endorsed the proliferation of wind turbines. Blade technology has increased a lot over the past few years. The blades have become longer, which means the windmills have to spin at lower RPMs. Uh, this has good impacts both for the efficiency of the turbines, and it also can reduce noise, and they also reduce the likelihood of bird strikes. You couldn't find a dead bird around the bottom of these turbines if you spent a month. You could put a wind turbine in someone's farm, someone's land, if cattle are grazing, or if you have an agricultural you know, entity going on there, a wind turbine is not going to stop that. Environmentalists have championed wind energy as a clean energy source. However, they fail to take full stock of the social issues associated with the production of wind energy. Opponents to wind energy have pointed to the noise produced by turbines as a persistent problem. However, the decreased necessary revolutions per minute brought on by increases in turbine blade technology have lowered noise levels. As blade technology continues to progress, these noise levels can be expected to continue to decrease. We are standing in close proximity to more than five wind turbines right now. As you can probably tell, the noise really isn't that much of an issue. We live right 1,200 feet from the turbine, and uh, we, we can't hear it at our house at all. Yeah. A car going by makes 10 times more noise than they do. Impacts on property values due to turbine sightings are another social concern. However, most studies suggest that turbines have little to no effect on property values. In fact, with increases in ecotourism, wind farms have the potential to drive property values up. But there's benefits potentially for, for landowners through royalties, and there's much more favor towards that right now than there was, say, in Nairi. And Nairi was defeated here because what was the benefit for the local landowners? It was the opposite. It was value detraction from high power lines coming through property owners. As John alluded, a significant social factor, especially in economically depressed areas like upstate New York, is the local financial benefit of wind plant siting. Energy companies make payments to land leasers, host townships, and also help fund local infrastructure. You know, what it does for the whole town, you know, it's not just the landowners, our taxes have gone down, you know, puts a pilot program for 15 years right into the town coffers, they get upgrade their equipment, better roads, 
helps the school districts. Then after the 15-year pilot program, they go on the assessment rolls, you know, and then everybody benefits, the whole county. So they get a royalty for it, and that makes all the difference in the world. Because now um, you're seeing, you know, compensation uh, for the wind turbines. And I know that these energy companies also did stuff to benefit the local communities outside of the property. So for me, it comes down to what's the incentive, financial incentive, for the people who's most affected by this. And that's how you gauge whether or not there's going to be support or non-support for a project, especially an energy project. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. This simple fact lays the foundation for the biggest obstacle for wind energy development, aesthetics. The aesthetic impact of wind turbines on landscapes is an extremely divisive issue. Its ability to derail wind farm siting is illustrated by the Cape Wind example. Some people don't like the look of windmills. Personally, I think they look pretty good. I think the best example is the Cape Wind project, which was just offshore the Cape, you know, between Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard, right. and the big money folks, many of whom are liberals and I like to support green energy, yep. were all, all lined up in opposition to it. From uh, Mohawk Valley through the Sequoia Valley into Shenango Valley, you would see um, an overwhelming number of signs out in front of people's property saying no to wind energy. And that's one of those barriers that's very difficult to overcome um, because it is people's opinions and how they view things. I think one of the really attractive things about wind en energy is just how neutral it is with respect to environmental justice issues because most importantly, you only can put it where the wind is. And people do these enormously complicated wind shed studies uh, w in order to decide where to site their facilities. And they tend to be on tops of mountains or offshore, and they tend not to be in areas where where people have located landfills. Uh, certainly they're not in urban centers, and, and those are the places where you know, dumps often go or where waste to energy plants often go because sure. people think it's easy to permit. So what you typically find with wind is that no one's making a decision where to site their facility based upon, gee, it's cheaper to do it there or the people are disempowered. Right. They're doing it where the wind is. So. I think you will see more and more communities build community wind projects that the community support because they like the green power right, right. that are largely unencumbered by environmental justice issues. Having identified the aesthetics of wind energy as the chief obstacle to its widespread acceptance, we propose using education as a facilitator of wind energy expansion. Citing wind farms in communities that find them ugly would be an environmental injustice. Doing so would violate the autonomy of these communities. However, if the public is educated on the myriad environmental and social benefits of the energy source, opinions might be swayed. In the case of the Fenner Wind Project, they've set up the Fenner Renewable Energy Education Center. Kiosks throughout the wind farm allow the public to come in and see it, and they also organize guided tours of the wind farm itself. My wife probably gives probably three to 4,000 kids bus tours. She gives uh, national bus tours. She probably has on an average of five or six thousand people, uh, you know, visit. Mm -hmm. But it's not—it's the best thing that's happened to this town since its conception. Well, wind is definitely a viable component of a broader national energy plan. It's uh, created an enormous amount of jobs, and of course, the economic benefits is going to rely largely on the willingness of the government to create incentives, both higher electric rates and a more favorable tax regime. Placing wind turbines in the larger context of long-term sustainability can facilitate the evolution of public perception of turbine aesthetics. Windmills would visually communicate, now and to future generations, our commitment to energy freedom and long-term sustainability. This is exemplified by the Fenner Wind Farm Project and how the community was able to rally around the sustainable energy source and embrace the aesthetic appeal of the wind farm. To me, when I look at a wind turbine, it makes me feel good. 